like broadcast now. Give everyone a minute to join. All right. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica from Greenlight Bookstore and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Dale Maharaj launching his new book, Fucked at Birth, Recalibrating the American Dream for the 2020s. He's going to be talking with Sarah Smarsh, so you are in for an excellent time tonight. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Dale, Sarah, and the team at Unnamed Press for making this happen and to all of you guys for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces right now, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversations and connections. A couple little housekeeping things before we get started. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen. There's a couple different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we do highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like a speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. You can tell us where you're logging in from and get it started. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find that by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations, 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase Dale's book and Sarah's and many others on site, or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S., and I'll drop the buy link in the chat. We are gonna have signed copies of this book available by early next week. You can put in your order now. And if you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Okay, so our interviewer tonight is Sarah Smarsh. She's a journalist who has covered socioeconomic class politics and public policy for the New York Times, The Guardian, The New Yorker, and many other publications. Her first book, Heartland, a memoir of working hard and being broke in the richest country on earth, was a New York Times bestseller and a finalist for the National Book Award. Smarsh was Shorenstein Fellow at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government in 2018 and, and a frequent speaker and commentator on economic inequality. Her new book is She Come By It Natural, Dolly Parton and the Women Who Lived Her Songs. She's gonna be speaking tonight with our featured author, Dale Maharaj. For two decades, he's been one of America's leading chroniclers of poverty. Alongside photographer Michael Williamson, his book And Their Children After Them won the Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction in 1990, revisiting the places and people of depression era America depicted in Walker Evans and James Agee's Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. With Jessica Bruder, he's also the co-author most recently of Snowden's Box, Trust in the Age of Surveillance, for which we hosted a virtual book launch back in April. So we're, back to we're grateful to have Dale back with us on the screen again. His new book, Fucked at Birth, explores the realities of being poor in America in the coming decade as pandemic, economic crisis, and social revolution upend the country. The book has been receiving advanced praise from critics and fellow authors, including Sarah Smarsh herself, who writes, Dale takes us coast to coast in 2020, down highways along which he first reported decades ago. His honed class awareness, unrivaled among contemporary journalists, reveals that today's confluent health, economic, and social crises are the logical conclusion to generations of unvalidated, untreated despair in a wealthy nation. Forget hollow commentary from detached television news studios in New York City, fucked at birth is the truth. So Dale and Sarah are gonna have a conversation about the book this evening and then open it up to chat with all of you. Dale's gonna start us off. So please, Dale, take it away. All right. All that was accurate, except I've been doing this for 40 years. I, I'm, a, I'm an old dude. Uh, I started writing about poverty and working class issues back when I uh, went to the Sacramento newspaper, the Sacramento Bee back in 1980. Uh, I rode the rails in 1982 with the new breed of hobos and all through the 80s documented the growing underclass. And I've done, oh, I mean, how many books I've done on it. And I, about a six, eight months ago, maybe a, you know, more like a year ago, because it was just before the pandemic, I was telling friends, I'm done with this work. I, what more can I say? Uh, if you look at my catalog, I've, I've covered a lot of, uh, from fate of sharecroppers to 
steel workers to um, uh, uh, economic inequality in California, I'm done. So then I, uh, the pandemic hits and I was teaching on Zoom, my Columbia students, some of them I see, are seeing the chat. Um, we had to go, go to Zoom. So I went to California to stay with a friend uh, on the coast. And about three and a half, four months into the pandemic, we were going crazy, like a lot of us. And we drove off to the desert and I'm gonna share. Now, this is not a well-oiled machine here, but let's give it a shot. I'm going to share um, a couple of photos. We stayed at this, uh, this really um, uh, uh, weird uh, uh, hotel uh, complex, kind of, kind of a resort from the 1930s. And we were the only people in the resort. Uh, and we, 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 it was just like, it was creepy. It was like one of those, those disaster movies. We're the only people on earth. And we left the next day and we drove out and we passed this gas station. I'm hoping you can see it um, with this American flag on the front. And this picture was taken weeks later when the light was good. It was noon, the light was harsh, and I told my friend, you know, let's not bother stopping. It's not worth a picture. And then I thought, no, no, my friend Michael S. Williamson, who I've done many of my books with, the photographer, he's when in doubt, stop. I said, stop. And so my friend stopped. We got out. We walked in this front door, and let me do a new share. This is what we saw inside. This graffiti, graffito on the back wall. And my friend said, I took a picture and my friend said, I knew you'd like that. Then the next thing she said was, that's the title of your next book. And, um, and I like, yeah, well, I'm not gonna do anything. And I won't go into the details of why I was motivated to write the book, but I quickly within days realized it is my next book. And I decided to go across pandemic America from homeless camps to the Navajo reservation to Black Lives Matter movement in Denver uh, meatpacking towns in the Midwest, where Sarah is, uh, and, um, uh, and end up in Youngstown in New York, uh, showing people the outer picture of the gas station and then the photograph inside the gas station of the graffito saying, what does this mean to you? And, uh, oh my God, they were, the responses were amazing. And that clearly became, my friend was right, it was the title of the book. So that's a short version of the, how it started. Well, I'm, I'm going to hop in now with some questions. Uh, hi, everybody. Sarah here. And um, actually, my first question to Dale, which, which he um, maybe anticipated somehow, was uh, pertaining to the origin story of the book, which is, uh, to my mind, in incredible in so many ways, um, metaphorical and literal, and uh, a kind of a uh, beautiful anecdote that exemplifies the ways in which the, the title is so authentic and true. Some, you know, lest someone see the cover and think, oh, there's some aspect of gimmick to a, a title with profanity in it, you know, that it, it actually, um, th that's reality, that's real, it's what's on the ground. And it was witnessed by um, Dale, who, as was mentioned in the introduction, has been uh, documenting basically industry deaths and downward spirals in, in economic and cultural senses across this country for decades. Um, just a little, just out of reverence to how many decades, and this isn't intended to make Dale feel old, it's rather for, for because like we, we happen to be in a moment where a lot of journalists are kind of swooping in to cover, you know, this, this, this beat. Um, I was born in 1980, so I'm 40 years old, no spring chicken. And, and Dale has had his finger on the pulse of this my entire life. I, am, I have sometimes thought about my age as sort of like sadly synchronous with the downward spirals that, the spirals that Dale documents, may or may not have to do with the outcome of the presidential election in 1980. We will leave that for another discussion and people to uh, handle that one themselves. But um, what because of the... Um, you know, the, the kind of like strata um, uh, in, in a geological sense of, of your work and understanding of the, the depth and breadth of the situation that we find ourselves in in 2020. I really want to start with your unique ability to situate this moment in a little bit of a, of a historical frame. So um, one of the things that I found the most compelling and striking about the narrative is the is the way in which you pass through places that and sometimes you even include you know Dale will like he'll say I've, I'm in route through fill in the blank in 2020 pandemic 
you know, apocalyptic USA. And he's flooded with memories about these, the, the previous iterations of those places, the way they have and have not changed sometimes including, you know, excerpts from his, his journalism from 1982 that was uh, done on, uh, in that spot. So, so my first question, I guess, is, um, and let me add to that, there's, there's like an, an incredible statement you make in the introduction where you say, um, I think like this is in the first few paragraphs, you make perhaps the bold assertion, but and yet perhaps no one would argue with it, that this year, 2020, is worse than 1968, which is a year that you associate with your youth. It's a year that started coming up um, in national discussions and national memory in the context of racial uprisings and, and our kind of reckoning with our white supremacist history and present. So, so, so position this in history for us, like, how, how is it that this year is worse than, than 1968? When you were out on the road encountering the present moment, but also the decades of history that you witnessed and documented there, like how did we get here? Where, how do we think about this moment in with some you know, historical sense? Well, I'm a student of the 1930s, even, even predates the 1960s. I grew up, this, I was one of those weird kids who wanted to hear all the stories from uh, grandparents and uncles and aunts who lived through the Great Depression. Uh, I couldn't get enough of it as a child. And then when I got older, I started studying the decade and studying the movements. And I get into the book, there's a chapter called the 20s or 30s. Uh, there's a lot of parallels I feel that are emerging now that are actually darker than the 1930s. The fascists were rising through the, uh, through the 1930s. They were ascendant. The, of course, there was the rally at Madison, Madison Square Garden in 1939 with 20,000 fascists. It, it looks like a Ronnie Reifenstahl film. If you see Laura Poitras's uh, documentary, she was a producer on. Uh, it's really scary how it was rising, but they never invaded the Capitol. And of course, the book was done before the what happened uh, last week. But so this is why I think it's darker, um, and it's it's darker at the same time. It's no different. Uh, as near as I can tell, there was a Reverend Burkhead, a Unitarian minister who studied fascism in the 30s. And he went to uh, Italy and he went to uh, Germany uh, to, 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 to for first hand look at Mussolini and Hitler. He came back and he determined there were about 800 groups in America that were fascist leaning. And he estimated about a third of Americans were exposed to fascist materials and believed in it, which is probably the same percentage today. Um, but you know, they flash forward into my youth in the 60s and Bobby and Martin and the dreams dying. Uh, and uh, it, it, it was so dark. As a kid, it seemed so dark growing up in that era. But at the same time, we had hope. I was in the, the, the young end of the hippies. I, I was a 12-year-old hippie kid in my, my tie-dye shirt and my, my, my bell-bottom pants. Um, and there was hope that the world was to be a better place, uh, even in the darkness. I don't feel the same sense of hope now. Um, and at the same time, I really think this is a, a moment. There's a professor John Russo quoted in the book. Uh, I think he may be in the, in the audience um, who talks about this is a, we're in a, this, this, this is a contested terrain between now and 2024. And so my hope with uh, the book is to, that fucked at birth, especially the chapter on the thirties that people look at it as a lesson for what's, going on right now because it's very eerily similar and how we deal with it in the next three to four years it is critical. It's it's incredible to me in some ways that you know this this book was so born of the moment and it is no doubt one of the first books to kind of emerge from um, 2020 as like sort of documenting it in real time. Uh, but yet yeah, it's, you know, backed up again by, by what, what you have known and seen for, for decades on the road as a reporter. Um, in, I, 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 you, you have always been very prescient in your work. And I think that the, that chapter that you just referenced and your, um, your attention in the narrative to where this is sending us in sociopolitical terms um, is, you know, just last week, um, proved uh, prescient. So, um, 
you cover a lot in the book in terms of uh, thematics. So, and that is because 2020 was, um, you know, a, a hot mess of multiple crises. Um, there's the health crisis, the economic crisis, a social crisis that has to do with a, a racial reckoning and police brutality. Um, who, uh, if, if you had to tell folks who, are, who hopefully will be, will be purchasing and reading the, the book soon, who does, fucked at birth describe? Wow. You know, I, I have a riff in the book about what fucked at birth means. Of course, I could interview the author of the graffito. That was impossible, but I, I channeled the author of the graffito through the people I, I interviewed. And every African-American person I showed the picture to said, uh, especially the, 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 a guy named Terrence Roberts in, in Denver, he's a Black Lives Matter uh, uh, movement leader. He said, of course, I was born a black male in America. Uh, 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 homeless people who's, who basically were resigned to, to being screwed when they were born. But also like I reflected myself, I was born in 1956. Yes, you make me feel old, Sarah, when you say <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were born when I started doing this work. Um, and in mid-century America, uh, I was born into a family. My father was a steel worker. My mother was a homemaker, later a bus driver, school bus driver. Blue collar, my father was hit by a, a, a drunk and we were on charity food for a while. Uh, I grew up working class. And, um, uh, and, but in that era, and, I, and I write, as I write, I, I fucked up as much as I did. Uh, my students will want their money back who are listening. I don't have a college degree, uh, but I'm teaching at Columbia. Long story how I got here. Uh, uh, but um, uh, I could fuck up that much and make it. But if you're born working class today, the odds of you breaking out like I did, I think are phenomenally less. Or you could be fucked at birth by, by chance. You, your, your father worked at the mill, your grandfather worked at the mill, and then the job goes to Mexico or wherever, and you didn't know it, and you're 45 or 50, and then suddenly you, you're out in the street. You're, not, you're, you're, you're driving for Uber or, or DoorDash. Uh, and so uh, the ways to be fucked at birth are many in America. And what I hope people realize is, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. Now, I won't go into the numbers, but in mid-century America, we were about 75% of the world's economy when I was born. And that's the spoils of World War II. Uh, basically, we were the victor, we were bombed, we ruled the world. Uh, uh, Lester Thoreau, the Harvard economist said, I, I, I met him once and he, he said that we were about 14% of the world's economy in, in World War I. And that's about what our natural sense should be. I think we're about 20% of the world's economy now. We were gonna go down as far as that economic uh, boom that we had in the 50s and 60s. But what didn't have to happen was the 1% amassing so much of the wealth. Uh, so what I hope the book also does is it gets people thinking about what does it mean to be an egalitarian society? It's not just because we're nice people, but economically we cannot have half the three quarters of Americans basically living in a virtual Great Depression, which it is for them. Uh, we look at the stock market and people think, some people think the economy is going well, but you go into middle America and it's not. And so I hope it erases that awareness. Um, on the topic of awareness, I, I was thinking about how, you know, your dual consciousness of sorts concerning class, which relates to, you know, where you come from, what you just spoke about, um, and and the world that you inhabit today professionally, makes you in some ways um, uh, particularly suited for for the kind of work that you do. Um, you've been seeing for a long time things that a lot of your colleagues had a blind spot toward uh, due to their relative class privilege. privilege. Um, you, because of that, having a foot in two different worlds. Um, have a, a kind of honed self-awareness or sense of your relationship to the country's um, various ladders of privilege, be they class, race, or, or otherwise. I'm curious, as you were on this odyssey in, in 2020, and you, you document so much about where we are and why we are in that place in terms of economics and, and just the, the, the nature of the amount of capital we have and, and it's been 
condensed among the, the 1%. But you also, I think, even more importantly, because a lot of books do that work, even more importantly, I think, is the, the, the sensitive heart you have toward the people with whom you, you feel a, almost a sense of um, uh, camaraderie or, or, or a, just a kind of vague sense that that could have been you. And perhaps because of that sensitivity, I feel that in the book, the reader has a moment to not just grapple with what, what's going on in a current event sense, but like in a sense of like our national morale and consciousness and, and, and the, that to go return to that phrase, which you used as a sort of jumping off point, even in conversations, what, you know, for people to be more fatalist than they used to be, or more cynical than they used to be, or, you know, this, this is like, this is also something that has to do with the, the fabric of a, of a would-be democracy and whether it survives or not. Like, did you, you know, you said that now you have a, you get a sense of much less hope than when you were a kid. In terms of the four decades of your reporting, did you feel that people had an increased sense of awareness of their relationship to those ladders of privilege? And if so, did it strike you as an accurate awareness or one that was, um, uh, you know, somehow misinformed? Well, you know, I, I've, I've said this before, I've written this before. Uh, Americans only like talking about class when it's preceded by the word middle. Everyone's middle class. And even the poorest people. Uh, I did a piece for Smithsonian Magazine back in 2016 on poverty versus the 1930s versus today. And I, I never forget, I, uh, it's interesting. They're aware and they're not aware. And I, I, one of the stories was in the Central Valley, uh, Madera, California. There's a, a, like, like a, this, this kind of a Habitat for Humanity uh, a group that build housing for uh, Latino farm workers. And they said 14 families at once build 14 homes. And I showed up to do the interview and I did my hour long interview and then uh, uh, there was over and I, you know, I had not much. Uh, yeah, I had some quotes, but not much. I said, you guys need to volunteer. And they said, uh, sure. Who's this, you know, this white guy gonna volunteer? Sure. So I worked for three days with these Latino guys, uh, Jack hammering in the soil and building and everything. And, and I got to really know them. And I got beneath the veneer. And I never forget, there was one man who was, who was not been a house built there. He worked in a raisin packing plant. And I said, do you consider yourself rich? Or, or, or what, what, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you consider yourself? Are you poor or, are you, or not, you're not rich. Are you poor? You know, what's, what, what are you? And he pointed to his white van, which was a beautiful white van. And he said, see that van over there? He said, I paid cash for it. I saved for three years to buy that van. You see the person in that fancy car that's got debt? Who's, you tell me who's rich and who's poor. And I thought that was the most beautiful answer I've ever heard from a working class person about what poverty or wealth or relations mean. Um, and I, I, I went away thinking, it's just, it's an amazing, if more Americans had his attitude, uh, that would be a beautiful thing. But he took great pride in the fact that he paid cash for his van and he had no debt. Um, so what is rich and poor? Uh, you know, and I worked next to that guy for three days. Uh, uh, that, that guy, he's, he's Latino and take, take away decades. He, that guy could have been my dad, you know, the same work ethic. Uh, I don't think that's changed in Americans. And I, I, I would like us all to be middle-class, but uh, that is a very, that's a shrinking number of people. Uh, it's the top 20%, the top quintile, then there's the rest of America. What surprised you when you were working on this book, if anything? I'm just wondering, you know, you, to my mind, you have like predicted so many things that no other journalist did. I'm just wondering if there was something that, that actually surprised you that you wouldn't have guessed. Well, there was a writer named James Rorty who went around the country in the 19, 1935, and it was called uh, uh, Puzzle, not Puzzle America, that's a different book. Uh, uh, it was about, I forget the title. I, I see I'm old, I'm at the senior moment. Uh, anyway, Rorty did this book uh, and he went around America and did what I did. And he, he was lamenting the Americans have this make-believe hope, things are gonna be better. Um, and, uh, and in the 1980s, I heard that when I was writing the rails with hobos, it was mostly men then, it was not feminized poverty yet. These guys would tell me, I'm gonna find a job. I'm gonna get a place. My life's gonna turn around. It'll be a better. And, this time, I didn't hear that. 
You don't hear it. In the homeless camps, when I showed the picture, uh, people said, well, I deserve to be here. I, I screwed up. Uh, it was the opposite of rarity and the opposite of what I heard in the 80s. That depressed me, that they were self-blaming. Only one homeless man didn't self-blame. John Krantz, who I actually met 10 years earlier, different story. There was John when I showed up in Sacramento and I showed him the pictures. He was the first guy I showed the pictures to. And he said, you know, in the, de in the Declaration, Declaration of Independence, they said, all men are created equal. He paused and he said, that was the first big lie. Uh, he knew, but most of the homeless people were, were just resigned and blamed themselves. And that's the mm. big change. Mm. Well, I think that gets back to my previous question about how, how has people's self-regard or sense of relationship to um, you know, public issues changed and, and, and to what extent did you find it accurate or misinformed? And it, it sounds to me like, um, you know, uh, c conservative talking points um, around the time that you were beginning your reporting career um, are now is sort of in terms of culture deeply, so deeply embedded that it's kind of a mission accomplished. Yeah, yeah, the freshwater economists were ascended uh, uh, you know, I, I, I got hired at the Sacramento newspaper. I was told I was hired the day after the 1980 election. And I, I took that as a sign uh, with Reagan's election uh, that my career was gonna have an interesting uh, twinning with, uh, with his, his career. Uh, and, the, and so the, 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 the Friedman School of Economics where, you know, it's, it's a free market and, and so forth was ascendant. Uh, you know, the things will trickle down that um, uh, if we give tax cuts to the rich, that'll help the poor. And over and over and over, we see that's not true. Uh, I think that's discredited. And to go political right now, so the Democrats have a, you know, they, they control it, barely control the Senate, but they control it. We have, we have a Democratic president. Will they actually do something? Or will it be the usual that I've heard my entire life, uh, the centrist Democrats, Oh, it's not time. We have to be careful. We have to be cautious. And if that happens, say hello to President Cruz or President Hawley in 2024, because people want change. Um, I could go on on that. I'll stop my political uh, uh, soapboxing, but that's that's a nutshell of it. Well, let's. Um, this this might be a, a some, somewhat political question, depending on how you feel it, and maybe that's not a bad thing. But but I think it gets maybe just to the heart of um, this project that we're all involved in the United States. Um, two questions, true or false, the United States was fucked at birth, <laughs> um, which, you know, I, I'm just thinking of that from the, the conversation with the, the homeless guy you recounted, um, citing the first big lie in the constitution. And, and then um, if so, what do we do about it at this point? We, you know, po politics are what they are, uh, a disaster. Um, where, where do you see the most um, efficient um, healing work can be done? Well, to answer your question, true or false, to, to, to hew to that, I would say true. We were fucked at birth, obviously, because we were, in, basically the country got invaded. Uh, 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 I did a book called The Coming White Minority in the 1990s. And uh, the, 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 books in the, the description on the book is of graffito that I found, I love graffitos, in the bathroom at old Cody's books on Telegraph Avenue. Remember, it's all an occupied country. We've, we've been inventing ourselves this artificial thing ever since the Europeans landed. Uh, it's been an experiment. I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad you called it an experiment because it's really what it is. And it, as a country on earth, it's not that old. It's an ongoing experiment. There's still time to heal it. At the same time, I think of Philip Roth's great line, probably his greatest line, the, the indigenous American berserk. Uh, there's a certain sense of um, violence in our culture. And people say that what happened in Washington is, is shocking. It's not us. No, it's us. Uh, you know, we, we killed the Indians. We killed the Native Americans. They, they called them Indian. We killed the Native Americans. Uh, we, 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 we've had this ongoing... Um, um, conflict. And I, I, my white minority book, I wrote, there was great pressure from Asia to also immigrate to America. And of course, the Chinese came to build the railroad. And we had the Chinese Exclusion Act, we had the Japanese, uh, we excluded the Japanese. Um, who said it was supposed to be the nation 
of a snapshot in 1956 when I was born. When I was born in 1956, it's an ongoing movie, like a reel. It's not a snapshot. Um, so we're constantly inventing ourselves. And I'm hoping that these, the, the Black Lives Matter movement in particular has impact because we need to be a better country. And, and this experiment, as, as, as you and others, in fact, Paul Krugman in the New York Times called it, we need to continue the experiment, but to make it work. Um, so you're not going to tell us how we can make it work based on your wisdom gleaned on, on the road as a reporter for decades, I guess. You can't just wave a wand and fix it. But um, I, I do get a sense from your work that what you sense, and this goes back to kind of your, your heart as a reporter um, that, that might have something to do with where you come from, um, a, a sense that what we are lacking foremost, and this is in some ways it, it dovetails with would be policies that are necessary, but in another sense, it's just an, a, an aspect of the, the character of a people and a place. Um, what we're missing is that first step that we might refer to as atonement or um, um, you know, reckoning, um, honesty, looking at the look, you know, I don't know who said this, but there's, you know, this truism, um, a problem well articulated is a problem half solved. And we've been, as you and others um, have in some lonely ways um, been documenting um, at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of this one, we are a country that has, has not only not well articulated the problems, but has been in abject denial of the problem. There are a lot of folks for whom that wasn't true. Uh, people of color who have always understood um, our white supremacist foundations, uh, poor folks who have always understood that the American dream is bogus and so on. Um, which, what, something that I was, that always blows my mind is like the things that you're, you're saying, my being a, a daughter of the rural white working class or working poor, um, they're, they're, they're not shocking to me either. Um, the folks who are, you know, are often well-intentioned and esteemed colleagues in journalism, um, are they, they last week they were shocked and I I'm wondering how you situate yourself within your industry you're often you know you're certainly not a marginalized voice but you are a kind of marginal voice sometimes in your your willingness to point a finger at and fully articulate problems that once reckoned with will strip some power and privilege away from um, some you know self-proclaimed liberals in powerful places. Um, so have you in your career found that that has been an impediment to getting the truth out? That sort of protection of privilege where you are, you know, you are kind of within the privileged bubble saying the, the unpopular thing. And if you could maybe tell us some stories of how. Oh my God, um, where do I go with that one? There's so many things I could go. You know, I, I live in two worlds. I, I, I belong in neither. That's been my, my life and my career. Uh, I call myself the ho hound dog in the house of poodles when I taught at Stanford and I teach at Columbia. I think there's like three professors in our building who are working class background. Uh, and I fit in with that world, but I don't. And, I, and now that I'm so far removed from my, my world of my father and my, I worked in a factory for a little while when I was young. I'm removed from that too. I'm sort of in the middle. I think I'm really, for, it's a, in a good way, I'm an outsider. Uh, I tell my students, you know, and most of my students are outsiders. I see a lot of them in the chats and uh, without using names, I, I, they're definitely outsiders for various reasons I won't go into. It makes the best journalist. Uh, in hell, I will be a Beltway pundit. Uh, I, you know, uh, I could be a whole lot more famous if I push myself in that realm. I, I'd rather be out in the middle of the country. I'd rather be in Kansas where you are talking to people than, than be in, uh, on CNN uh, in, the, in, the, in the bubble here. Uh, I'm in New York right now. Um, so I'm trying to show the world, and and it's it's depressing. Uh, and you made a comment earlier about what I I'm not going to give you solutions. Uh, anytime I give solutions or predictions, I'm usually wrong. But we know what the solutions are. Uh, it, it's it's a matter of healthcare. It's a matter of that's the biggest cost for most people having healthcare, being more like Canada and less like uh, like us. Uh, 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 decent minimum wage, um, 
a little more uh, uh, tax system that doesn't favor the wealthy. The wealthy didn't need tax cuts four years ago. Um, giving advantages to working class people, housing. Oh my gosh, I have a, the cover story in the nation this week uh, about the eviction crisis that's coming. 30 to 40 million people are at risk of eviction according to the eviction lab in Princeton. Um, and that many people won't become homeless, but even if a tiny fraction does, it's stunning. Uh, Professor Gary Blasi, who I've met in LA, uh, who studied this for years, predicts that at least several hundred to 400,000 people in LA alone have the risk of becoming homeless. Um, this is care about these people. You know, that's a good start. Um, uh, it doesn't, this isn't rocket science, the things we can do to help people. Uh, but I'm not a policymaker. I'm the guy who does these books that uh, don't sell that, that much, that many copies. I, I, uh, uh, if I had to live off my books, I'd be living under, under a bridge with my, uh, with my subjects. Um, but I, I just, I was, I'm, I'm gonna keep, I'd rather be an outsider and keep doing what I'm doing. And hopefully maybe with this book, maybe it'll get some traction and people will get some ideas for, from it. I am going to field some of the questions from the audience just to make sure that we get to all of them. And then if we've got some time, kind of turn back to our conversation. Um, wow, I bet that you've got some hardcore insights on this because I know you to be um, a man who is concerned about privacy and you've written about it and you've lived it and you've been involved in some moments in history that concern it. Um, uh, Sarah Collins asks, how much of the, the lack of hope that you were talking about do you attribute to technological advance, advancements? And she doesn't expand on what she means by that, but presumably social media and all these gadgets we carry around. Yeah, well, you know, it's another topic, another book. We are disconnected as a culture, uh, but people do love community. Uh, and as an example, to turn to the book, there's a, a camp in Sacramento called the Island. And I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna show you a photo. Let's see if I can make this work. Uh, guess which one it is, let's see, there it is. Okay, this woman, uh, Tawana James, she, this is her, it's a, it's a camp, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tent in the middle of the forest. And everything you see with exception of um, uh, the table and I think one of the knickknacks came from a dumpster, the television, the fan, uh, and what you see at her feet are, are rolls of dough. And she uh, makes, is, is 70 people live in the place, it's called the island. It's, it's on the Sacramento River, north of downtown. Uh, she, she, she bakes uh, dinners for these people. It's almost, it's a, it's a cooperative. It's like a, it's, I, and I hearkened it to uh, John Steinbeck's, uh, in the Grapes of Wrath, he had the Weed Patch Camp. Uh, run by Tom Collins. It was thinly veiled in a novel and it was run like a collective. People in the most dire straits want community. And I saw it there in the island. They, 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 they look out for each other. They cook for each other. Uh, we really want that, but we are disconnected. Um, but to go to a homeless camp and see probably more community there than you see in a lot of uh, cities uh, among, among you know, regular people who are working uh, was, was very educational to me. Yeah, this is a good point for me to hop in and say, um, if you don't know, if you do know Dale's work, you wouldn't have this concern. But if you if you don't know Dale's work, I assure you, um, this book is not what we might refer to as poverty porn. And one of the reasons is um, often you will you will find yourself not pitying uh, the the subject, but but understanding the the heroism and and triumph of their lives amid these horrifying circumstances um, sometimes demonstrating feats of character that you would be hard pressed to come by in very privileged spaces so um, here's another question that's kind of in the same vein of cause and effect and how did these things happen this is from rob peters do you think the self-blame you're seeing has anything to do with the decline of organized labor and recent last two or three decades trend of owners making workers feel like they're doing them favors, giving them jobs? It sounds like Rob might know a thing or two about this. Paying them barely above minimum wage and the culture of, if I'm not working myself to death, I'm lazy. Absolutely. Uh, no, uh, I think uh, 
it's been inculcated in Americans that we're individuals, we do it on our own, we're, we're gonna pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We may not have any boots, but you, you know, you're supposed to pull yourself up. And uh, I, we're seeing glimmers of labor organizing. Uh, you know, Amazon uh, is, 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 you see organization as some Amazon. Google workers are, are organizing. This isn't just working class people. I, I, I saw one tweet about making fun of the Google workers. Oh, they're so, they need, we all need to be organized as workers, white collar, blue collar. Uh, you have strength then. And so hopefully if 20s are 30s in a good sense, we saw labor law protections under Franklin Roosevelt that have been eroded over the years. And we need to have those come back. And if workers can organize, again, that's a part of building strength for working class people. So I do hope that happens. I believe that in that answer, you used the term or phrase bootstraps, which leads us to a question from Stephanie. Um, and I don't want to put you in an awkward position that I have been put in myself. So answer this however you like. What are your thoughts on bootstraps type books, which have gained considerable popularity like Hillbilly Elegy? Your book seems more, and this is very important, she wrote she typed an ellipses. <laughs> Your book seems more heavy ellipses, realistic. I don't want to diss uh, fellow authors, but I will. Hillbilly Elegy and the movie, I'm not seeing the movie, I've only read the review, so I, I can't, shouldn't criticize it. Um, it's, it kind of plays into the bootstraps mythology. You know, the author of Hillbilly Elegy pulled himself out uh, and, and so forth, uh, you know, that book got a lot of traction, had a great title, I guess. Maybe it, it fed into the myth of bootstraps. Uh, you know, reality is different than, than that for a lot of people. Uh, if you don't have an education, if you get pregnant when you're 16, if so many things happen to you that you don't have the opportunities to get out, you don't even know that that opportunities exist. I mean, how many people I interview uh, in, in my travels who, who weren't aware of, of the worlds out there? The, the impossibility seemed to them of going to college, uh, much less succeeding. So I don't have much sympathy for that kind of work. Uh, question just, you mentioned in your answer, uh, teen pregnancy, and that just, I realized we haven't really talked about gender and you mentioned uh, reporting kind of pre-feminization of poverty in some by some measures. And I think that Hannah jumped in to the chat as opposed to the Q&A, but I saw her ask, um, did you witness evidence of that, what, what has been termed feminization of poverty in your trip uh, last year? Oh my gosh, uh, you know, I, I, I yes. Uh, when I was in the food bank line in, uh, in Denver, uh, uh, Joel Hodge, an African-American fellow who, who was in a prison and he started this food bank and the people who are coming through, I stood there for hours watching people come through mostly women, um, uh, the, 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 in the middle of the country, the meatpacking plants, it's a mix of it's genders, but pretty similar. Uh, I interviewed uh, Dulce Castaneda in, uh, in uh, Nebraska about her family who's, who worked in meatpacking plants. Uh, uh, very much, uh, but on the road in the homeless camps, I guess, I would say, I'm trying to quantify how many people lived in the camps were women versus men. I would say 30, 40% of the camps were women, which I did never saw that in 1980. So uh, my first book, Journey to Nowhere with Michael Williamson, we were criticized when it came out in 1985. There's no, there are no women in it, but we didn't see any women. We looked for them. Actually, Life Magazine wanted us to document uh, a couple, a family, which we never found. We, we were desperate to search for them. But even by 1985, you were seeing more women. And today it's off the charts, the, 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 how poverty has been feminized. Uh, and what you don't see, what you don't see is the women like um, uh, who are working single mothers who are barely hanging on. They're not in homeless camps, but and I, you know it was beyond my the scope of my my research to to go that I was you know going across the country trying to get this book out. I, I didn't linger anywhere. But. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense, and um, I believe this is still true. The the most common household type. Of, among people living in, po in poverty is single mothers and their children. Um, but but uh, homelessness is a, a kind of different sphere. Um, 
Craig asks a question that we absolutely must address because it's so central to your book and the reason that it comes out of this moment. And I didn't ask this question and I should have. Um, it's just basically the, um, you know, the, the, the chain of events that you describe at, at the beginning of the narrative has to do with the pandemic and your relationship to it and um, ending up in LA and being in deserted airports and, and needing to get back to New York City. Um, Craig asks, has the pandemic exacerbated the economic problems you're describing and how did you see that in your travels? Oh, it's, if I can use a, a, a bad pun, it's unmasked it, uh, is always there. And it's ripped bare right now. Uh, we can't ignore it. We have this, this incredible eviction crisis happening. And I didn't mention 80% of the people who face eviction are people of color. Uh, when I was in Los Angeles, I, I was uh, talking to a, a fellow who ran a safe uh, 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 parking uh, uh, for women, actually. I went to visit it one night. In the, in the, I was in the, the, the shadows of the buildings of, of downtown LA, the financial district. And we were talking about this. And it fundamentally is going to make it harder for working class people. Yes, there'll be a recovery. recovery. Later this year, the top quintile will spend money like crazy when there's a vaccine around. You're going to see, well, it's, we're back. But as Mel, Mel Tickler, Tickler Nate pointed out, who ran uh, the Shower of Hope, he said, these businesses that are changing forever, he said, they're, the people are going to not work in offices as much as they used to. What does that mean? You have five or six less fewer security guards. You don't have a cafeteria. You don't have the cleaning help as much. You don't need that. All those jobs are gone forever. So as bad as it was before the pandemic, working class people face it even harder in the coming retail. Amazon has gone ascendant. All these stores are closing. Will they come back? Not the way they were. And then when they come back, they're going to get more automated. And so we're losing more jobs. And so the pandemic is, is just, it's, it's just this unmasking and we're going to see even worse situation when we're supposedly in recovery and everything's back to normal. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense that that kind of um, crisis revealing a somehow masked long-term crisis will force the force the hand isn't isn't the right phrase to describe the sense that I get from Washington that um, you know ideas and policies in recent history regarded as uh, radical are now being inter seemingly entertained by um, you know self-proclaimed centrists maybe. Um, it's just lip service, or could this moment be, I guess, um, the, like, sort of like their, their excuse to do something that deep down in their heart of hearts they normally would do if it weren't for political pressures from the establishment? Hmm. I, I I'll often quote the, uh, the, the Archbishop of uh, Brazil, Dom Helder Camara, if I get his name correct. He said, uh, when I feed the poor, they call me a saint. And when I, uh, I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. Um, and so uh, is caring for people radical? Is, is, is making sure that they have a decent wage radical? Is making sure people have healthcare radical? I, I don't see that as being very radical, frankly. Um, and again, this is not uh, uh, changing systems. There's, there's ways that are too, too complex to mention here uh, within a, a hybrid form of capitalism, you can have all these things. This isn't socialism or communism. Not that socialism is necessarily bad. Um, uh, I, I've written about a, a model in Cleveland, the, the evergreen companies, where it's, it's a hybrid capitalist model, where it's worker-owned cooperatives. And it's what they're doing in Cleveland. If the, that could be replicated, it's like the Mangaradon Corporation in Spain, which has 80,000 employees. It's, it's wholly owned by its workers. It doesn't be, it's not beholden to Wall Street. Money doesn't flow to big bank bankers and on their yachts. It goes into the pockets of workers. There's a lot of models of capitalism that would be much kinder and gentler that would work and we would have a better society. So I, I, went, yeah. I went to solutions, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I don't know if you saw, but the Times about a week ago did a big story on that, um, uh, the, the, the cooperative, um, capitalism in Spain you were just describing that I think is in the Basque region. Um, if anybody wants to learn more about that, I'm sure that story is somewhere uh, around the Times website. It was, it taught me a lot. I feel like I, um, 
that that is one kind of thread that if Democrats had any sense in how they try to reach rural America, which there's little evidence that they do, but one kind of vein of um, the, the rural American experience that, that very much drives with some of the, you know, so-called leftist ideas that we're describing now um, is, is the concept of the co-op. Uh, you know, every, every summer I got in our old wheat truck and I drove the grain to uh, a wheat cooperative. We called it the co-op and maybe we didn't think very much about what it um, represented and, and know much about its history. Uh, in agriculture and agrarian life, but um, there, there are there are some little bits of American culture that that could could show the way, I think, and make people less um, fearful about those sorts of tweaks to capitalism. Um, there's there's a few more questions I want to make sure we get to before we wrap. We've got less than ten minutes now. Um, I think this is a super interesting question because there's a lot of talk about the digital divide. Um, and yet all the same, um, there are folks who are technically uh, in poverty who have access to cell phones and, and such. Um, Brian asks, well, first he says, he's glad that you stepped up to tell these sorts of, sorts of stories again, and he thanks you. Um, and, and he wonders how you've seen technology affect the experience of being homeless or struggling in America between now and your time on the rails in the 80s for good and ill? Wow. Well, technology, it's hard to find a homeless person now who doesn't have a cell phone. And you, people might think, well, that's kind of crazy. How can they afford? You can't afford not to have one. If you want to look for work, you want to access services, you got to have access to the internet. Uh, it's, it's, oh, it's, it's almost required. So I, I think seeing cell phones in homeless camps is a difference. When I was in Sacramento, uh, I was walking along the levee and oh, I got to show this picture, and I'll tell this story with this picture. This this is uh, uh, very mind blowing to me. This picture, okay. So I was in Sacramento, and this picture above was Dorothea Lang's picture from 1936 on the American River, a homeless camp. This is the same spot within a hundred yards below today when I was there. So I'm, I'm I come to this camp. There's hundreds and hundreds of of people living in this in this hobo jungle uh, river camp, and I go down the levee and I meet a a, a man from Oakland who uh, had a three solar panels and a battery, and he was you know, charging the phones of his of his neighbors. So you see solar panels and a battery in a in a in a in a homeless camp. Uh, so you see this technology there. In a way, it's kind of cool, and in a way, it's kind of scary that it's gotten so entrenched that people have solar panels and are solar powering their camps. Um, that's how permanent these camps have become. So that's probably, the technology has come in like that. Uh, the level of danger and violence though has gone way up. Uh, uh, in Sacramento, uh, it felt real hairy. They called, one of the camps uh, is called the snake pit. Uh, and I asked the guy who had the solar panels, why do they call it the snake pit? He says, these, snake, this, these snakes have two legs, he said. Um, people come in and, and, and rob and, and torture people and terrorize people. Uh, it wasn't that dark in the, in the 80s. And so the island, the other camp I showed the picture of with the women, they've separated themselves. They're, they're older people and they keep the outsiders out. They've had their little, own little closed world. So the danger level is up. Uh, that's, a, that's one of the big changes. Juan asks, two of the most affected communities by the pandemic and economic downturn are Native Americans and illegal immigrants. In your travels, did you encounter either of these communities and how are they coping during these uncertain, time, uncertain times? Well, I went through the Navajo reservation. Uh, I didn't set anything up there. I had two weeks to report across America. Uh, it's my, my writer friends want to kill me. I, I, I just, I just, I had this book, I felt very, um, um, felt imperative. I had a very imperative mission. I went across America for two weeks and then I wrote it in three weeks. Uh, uh, and uh, my publisher fortunately got it out this fast. Um, so in the Navajo Reservation, I didn't really spend much time. I, I didn't want to knock on doors with the, with the, the pandemic and the virus raging. I couldn't do that, obviously. And then uh, I did, I talked to uh, people who were undocumented in the middle part of the country, in Denison, Iowa, and in, uh, uh, in, in Nebraska. Uh, the young woman I interviewed in Nebraska, her parents came from Mexico. Uh, 
uh, undocumented, I believe, and became documented later. Uh, uh, it's a different experience when you're undocumented. You have no power. In Los Angeles, uh, there are several hundred thousand undocumented immigrants who face eviction uh, who aren't getting any of the funds from the government because they don't have papers. Uh, so, but they're the ones who are people who are making the food for us. They're growing the food for us. And they're really, really gonna get hit hard. And no matter what you think about immigration, they're human beings. And so I, I, I hope that they don't get lost in, the, in, in all of this. Mm. Uh, Kiba had a question also about undocumented immigrants with, among the working class. Um, and she points out that on top of all the, the challenges that they're facing, as she says, there's another layer of anti-immigrant rhetoric coming from the top down, you know, amid um, all of these other challenges. So um, did you, she says, did anything in particular stick out to you in these conversations? Absolutely. You mentioned earlier that I revisited a lot of places that I, I've been documenting over the years. And one was Denison, Iowa. I lived in Denison, Iowa for one year uh, in the early 2000s. And um, uh, 8,000 residents total uh, of the 8,000, 3,000 Latinos. And there were no Latinos there 10 years before. And they were buying houses. And there were two factions of whites in town. One faction uh, welcomed them as, as new blood, new lifeblood for the town. The other were anti-immigrant. And they were, but they were buying houses, they were creating businesses, they were creating uh, a good economy there. When I went back this time, Nathan Mark, the former mayor, one of the friend of mine who I know very deeply, I got to know when I was living there, said, they're all leaving. He says, he teaches in the high school. He says, my kids, from, their, their parents came from Mexico, they're going back to Mexico. The town is actually harmed by the rhetoric coming down from the top in the most uh, egregious way. They're not buying houses. Uh, and it's a, it's a real impact on the economy. And so mm -hmm. um, it, that's definitely, we see it in Denison. That's a microcosm, I think, of a lot of towns in the middle of America. Uh, let's try to get in two more questions. There's only a few minutes left, but um, Jack has a really interesting question that kind of points toward a hot, um, I don't know, good vibes. He says, when I first heard the title of this book, I immediately flashed on the titles of Woody Guthrie's autobiography, Bound for Glory, and the 1967 edited collection of his writing, An Art Born to Win. Part of what feels so tough about the present is the degree to which cynicism and hopelessness is reflected back to those already feeling like they were fucked at birth. Are there any Guthrie-esque figures, musical or otherwise, who provide authentic, hopeful messages? Anyone you've met in your reporting who you think is carrying Guthrie's fire these days? Well, I'm biased. Uh, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, uh, I know Bruce, long story. He was inspired by my first book with Michael Williamson to write a song called Youngstown uh, uh, about the death of the steel industry. And in, in the catalog of Bruce's music is a lot of hope. Uh, and so I'm partial to him. Uh, boy, that puts me on the spot. I'm trying to think of other, other artists who I would put in that category. Oh, I think uh, James McMurtry, uh, is, I'm a total fan of him. Uh, he, uh, he writes about the middle of the country in a way, and he writes about people's hopes and dreams. So those are two artists that come to mind. Mm -hmm. So last question, I think this is a good one to end, end on with apologies to the uh, couple or few folks we won't get to. Kathleen asks, there is a rise in fascism across Europe, and since 2008, significant increases in homelessness in countries where it has historically been very low or at least invisible. Do you think this is a particular problem of fuckedness, or excuse me, do you think this particular problem of fuckedness is unique to the United States or is it rising everywhere? I think it's rising everywhere. Uh, I did a uh, project back uh, after 9-11 about a, a young woman in West Virginia, Katie Sierra, who protested the Iraq war and was expelled from school. And she found solace in, uh, uh, I'm having another senior moment, the, the, there was a John Tinker. John Tinker was uh, part of the Des Moines uh, Board of Education v. John Tinker case in the Supreme Court, where he wore a black armband to school uh, and was expelled. And he was helping Katie. And, I talked about this with him and he says, I think humans have a fascist gene complex, he said. Uh, we have to fight it. And I think, you know, roughly uh, to rapidly close, about a third of Americans were fascinated and enraptured by fascism in the 30s, about the mm -hmm. same percentage today by all measures. Uh, 
it's something that's always been with us. It will be with us and we have to just combat it. So. Uh, well said, and thank you for all of your incredible insights. Thank you to everybody that uh, weighed in with questions and I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Greenlight Bookstore. Thanks for letting me ask questions. Thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks, Neil, for being here with us tonight and everyone else for being here and asking your really, really smart questions tonight. Um, I'm putting the buy link in the chat one more time so you can get your copy of Fucked at Birth from Greenlight. You can even get it signed by Dale if you'd like. Thanks so much for your support of the bookstore and of these awesome authors. And thank you guys for talking with us tonight. Thanks everybody. Thank you.